Well, welcome everyone. Welcome back, um, all the familiar faces, and welcome anyone who may be joining us for the first time. If you if you are our first or second time, whatever. If you are, please feel free to let us <coughs> let us know. Um, you put something in the chat if you'd like to. Um, everyone is warmly welcomed to this Sunday morning class. Um, time flies, but we've been, I've been teaching a Sunday morning class at this time. We're now in the 23rd year, so uh, it's, uh, this has been the routine. This has been the, the way I've spent Sunday mornings for uh, going back to the year 2000. And a lot of water has, uh, gone under the bridge since then but it's always it's always be good good to be together and good to practice together good to explore the the teachings and the practices of of the dharma the buddha's teachings and practices and and to to be together in in community and sangha so welcome to this class that's offered by the insight meditation community of washington and the Center for Mindful Living, which is part of IMCW. And uh, welcome, <coughs> Ilian, and uh, is it Iliana um, from Arlington, and Prana uh, for the second time. I'm glad you, glad you, you could be with us. Um, Nizreen, welcome back. Sorry to hear that it's been chaos, but glad that you're back. See you. Yeah. Welcome everyone. And please feel free to, to use the chat if anything comes up for you, if you want to share how you're doing right now as we as we're beginning our time together if you you know have any anything that your difficulties you're working with or any joys you're experiencing um please feel free to share them or anything in between um, um it's good to know and good to be able to share things together um you know recognizing much of our our suffering, as the Buddha teaches, um, comes from the, the kind of the illusion, really, that we're that we're on our own, that we're holding it all. You know, we have the world on our shoulders. You know, whether it's whatever we're dealing with, um, and sometimes, and it can be very, very helpful just to shift out of that misunderstanding, or we might say, um, and recognize that. You know what we are experiencing is being shared by many other people around the world in some form or another, you know, now or in the past, and and recognizing our our shared humanity, our shared joys and and sorrows, and um, can kind of help us help bring us back to uh, um, you know back to reality, if you like, out of out of the out of the illusions of, you know, that keep us tied, keep us entangled in suffering. So um, I'm Hugh Byrne, and um, this is uh, the theme of uh, the session. Our class today will be, uh, will be working with hindrances, difficulties that arise in meditation and in life, um, what in, what in uh, what the Buddha called the the hindrances, five particularly five mind states. You could say five energies of the mind that get us caught up, get us entangled, and how we can work with those energies, how we can work with them, and really untangle ourselves from them, so that we so that we don't we don't suffer. Um, we can find our way out of suffering, out of entanglement, and we can live with greater ease and well-being in our lives and greater freedom. And, um, <clears throat> and in terms of the format, the you know it's fairly straightforward. We we know these days we begin with um, 
a, a, a period of meditation, about maybe 20 minutes or so. Then I'll um, talk on the theme for, th for today. Um, and uh, then um, Emily will lead us in some movement, kind of allowing us to kind of come into our body so we're not comfortable the whole time, but we can open up and, and bring, bring presence to bring awareness to our sensations. Then we'll have um, some time for sharing um, in small group, in the small groups or in the full group. And then we'll come back to um, for a shorter meditation to finish and some announcements. And I'm just looking at what people are sharing. Um, so welcome Stacia from Chicago and uh, Welcome back, Ms. Reen. Sean, tennis and travel kept you away. Looking forward to resuming regularly. It's good to hear. And Rachel, I used my skills to stay calm, sort of, when I locked myself out of my apartment last night while my daughter was inside sleeping. All was well. Told myself to breathe and not go down the road of what ifs. Great to hear. So good. Glad you were able to use the practice to. Uh, to not get too wrapped around the axle and caught up in things, which can be very helpful. And Ileana, um, may the obstacles to physical and mental health be removed for my nephew who recently sustained multiple injuries in a car accident. So sorry to hear that. <clears throat> and I invite us all to, to hold him um, in compassion and loving kindness. Maybe we can dedicate our practice to him and, and to all those who are who are suffering physically or mentally right now. Um, and um, may they be healed and um, know well being, happiness. So thank you for, all for sharing that and Please feel free to um, to share things that come up for you in the in the comments. Probably a good idea not to do it during the meditation, but um, at other times, fine to do that. So we'll we'll begin as we as we do with a <clears throat> with a period of meditation. And then I invite you to take some moments to come into a posture that's comfortable and relaxed. So wherever you are, you know, you might be reclining or you might be sitting or some folks might be joining us walking or wherever you are, just let your attention come into the body. Dropping, dropping out of thinking, and just letting yourself settle. Letting yourself arrive, be here. So this is really a practice of, of awareness and kindness. So awareness of what we're experiencing with an attitude of kindness and friendliness. So we're not trying to get somewhere or become Olympic meditators. We're just trying to, just, just settling into being here. As Mary Oliver says, uh, you know, let the soft animal of you loves. You don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert, repenting. You just have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. So letting, letting yourself settle into, into being here.
letting your back be straight without being tense or rigid, the shoulders relaxed. So you're relaxed and at the same time aware, alert, aware of your experience. You might ask, what am I, what am I noticing right now? Just make space for what is here. You might deepen your breathing and take a few longer, deeper breaths to help you arrive and settle. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, calming the body. <clears throat> Breathing out, calming the mind. What is it that helps you to be, to be present, to be, to be here? Might be the smile, inviting a smile to your face and letting the smile be a way of helping the, the body and the mind settle. sending a message that we can be at ease, that we can relax, arrive. And you might invite the smile to be a kind of an attitude that you bring to, to whatever's coming up. So if there's something difficult coming up, you might consciously meet it with the attitude of a smile, maybe with the, the expression of a smile. You might scan your body, just briefly moving the attention down and see if there's anywhere where you might unconsciously be tensing up that you could relax a little bit more. can be helpful to begin a meditation with a reflection on gratitude, just a few things in your life that you When we invite gratitude or reflections of gratitude, we're consciously shifting out of what may be more reactive, focuses on what's wrong or what we don't like, to remembering what we have. The 
people and conditions in our life that support us. There's this life that supports us, this earth, the air we breathe, the water, the sun, the rain, the animals, trees. So easy to forget about all that we have and be fixated on, you know, what we lack or what we need. So it's inviting to reflection on gratitude if, if that's helpful. And at the heart of our practice is opening to what is here right now. So for you in this moment, what is calling for attention? Is there something that feels like it's getting in the way of being, really being here now? Is there something that you're finding difficult on not liking that you wish wasn't here? And if, if there is, just notice that. Bring awareness to it with kindness. If there's something that you feeling you're want, wanting or needing, kind of reaching out for that. Just notice that. Notice how it feels. Just let the feelings come and go without identifying with it. Just awareness with kindness. If it's helpful, you might let your attention rest on the breath, on the experience of the body breathing, breathing in, 
anything out. If there's a sense of ease or well-being, allow yourself to really feel that, experience it. Pleasant feelings in the body, perhaps, perhaps warm feelings in the mind without clinging to anything, just letting it come and go, but appreciating, appreciating. If there's an absence of difficulties or problems or challenges, If you have a feeling of tiredness or lethargy, a kind of collapsing feeling, you might just bring, let your attention come to that. Just bring your awareness to those feelings. And just breathe into bodily feelings. Maybe, maybe helpful to take a few deeper, longer, deeper breaths. bringing some energy into the body and the mind. Maybe opening the eyes if you're feeling sleepy. If you feel the energy is really strong, there's kind of feeling of restlessness, kind of a bit of agitation. Just bring awareness to that with kindness too. You might consciously invite a closer awareness to your breathing, just helping maybe calm the body and the mind and settle it.
at times doubt may come up about yourself, about your practice, or about the teachings. And you can bring awareness to, to that too, you know, noticing the thoughts, not choosing to, to believe the thoughts. It's allowing yourself to feel whatever but bodily feelings are coming up. You might reflect on something that inspires you, maybe a teaching that inspired you or something that encourages you or encouraged you to practice, to get on the path or in the journey. So noticing any difficulties or hindrances that, that might be present and making space for them. Just bringing awareness to them. Staying as close as you can to the, your direct experience. And noticing thoughts, being aware of thoughts rather than following them wherever they go. holding and making space for whatever is here right now, with kindness, with acceptance. So nothing has to be pushed away or listed or rejected or escaped from. Just everything can, can come and go in its own time. Chogyam Trungpa said, there's no need to struggle to be free. The absence of struggle is itself freedom. <clears throat> there's no need to struggle to be free. The absence of struggle is itself freedom. Can whatever is present right now be held in a, in, a, in a field of kindness with the intention of, of kindness, befriending whatever we're experiencing? Even if it's quite difficult, We befriend the difficulty.
whatever energies are present in the body and the mind and the heart, these aren't in themselves problems. You know, even if there's a strong energy of fear, for example, or anger or grief, they only become a problem when we identify with them, when we get hooked on them, you know, swept up in them. So the invitation is just to keep, keep holding whatever is here and let the, the field of kindness large enough to, to hold the difficulties, the joys, the sorrows, the full catastrophe as Zorba the Greek spoke of it. You know, all the difficulties of our world you know that can we can get into a lot of tangles around you know fear about where where things may be headed or how things are causing suffering and and how we can get very entangled in that which is not to say not to care but to say to care in a different way, you know, without making it me or mine, without the clinging. So this invitation to befriend, befriend our experience. and not leave anything out. finish with this poem by Wendell Berry, I Go Among Trees. I go among trees and sit still. All my stirring becomes quiet around me like circles on water. My tasks lie in their places where I left them, asleep like cattle. Then what is afraid of me comes <clears throat> and lives a while in my sight. What it fears in me leaves me, and the fear of me leaves it. It sings, and I hear its song. Then what I am afraid of comes. I live for a while in its sight. What I fear in it leaves it, and the fear of it leaves me. It sings and I hear its song. After days of labour, mute in my consternations, I hear my song at last and I sing it. As we sing, the day turns, the trees move.
welcome, um, welcome anyone who joined us um, during the uh, during the meditation after the beginning opening. Um, Nadia asks, um, where can I find the text of it? Uh, the poem was uh, Wendell Berry, and it's um, I Go Among Trees. Wendell Berry. And uh, so welcome again, everyone. Welcome back. Um, what I'd like to do is continue a little bit in the vein of the meditation to talk about difficulties that arise in in meditation and and in daily life and i think particularly in uh, in our meditation practice um, i don't think anyone has meditated at least for any significant period of time without difficulties coming up in their in their meditation then maybe there's one or two people who've sat down and just immediately everything was was airy and spacious and light filled <laughs> and and there were never any problems or difficulties coming up i think that's a rare thing certainly wasn't the case for the buddha you know who who went through a lot of his journey, um, you know, was a was a was a very you know very diligent and you know lasted for six years once he left uh, the palace, as it were, but obviously went on before that, before he found an end to suffering. And um, most of us, um, you know, however long we'll, we're pra we've practiced, will will experience difficulties coming up and. In the meditation, I kind of went t touched on um, five that are classical difficulties in uh, in in the Buddha's teachings. Um, you know the, what are called the five hindrances, and uh, I want to talk some in a fairly general way today about these hindrances and how we work with them. Um, and uh, in coming classes, I, I think I'm going to get into maybe a little bit more, you know, the more more of the practices, but probably a lot a lot to to do to to cover all of these hindrances and 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 how we work with them in one you know one thirty minute um, session. So this will be a little bit of an overview, um, you know, of how we work with all of the hindrances, and then obviously they have their very um, specific expressions. But you know, as as you've no doubt noticed in your own practice, we you know we sit down to meditate, and uh, you know the mind often doesn't just want to sit down and be still and be aware of the breath or you know whatever else we're experiencing. You know, maybe a, an uncomfortable bodily feeling comes up and, you know, maybe it keeps recurring and we get annoyed about it. Or a thought comes up that, oh, I could be doing this or that right now. And we get pulled into that. Or maybe I should have been doing that. And we kind of get, get hooked on that. Or a, a difficult memory comes up, you know, an unpleasant experience, a conflict we had, let's say, with somebody, and we get pull, keep getting kind of pulled back into it and getting tangled up in it. Or we we just get caught up in fantasizing or daydreaming, you know, and that's, um, you know, and that, and it's so it can be hard to be present. So these movements of the mind are extremely common. I'm sure they're common to all of us here um, and shared by almost, I say almost everyone. I don't, can't speak for every last person, but everyone I've spoken to about, you know, about these teachings, about these practices will, you know, work with some, some difficulties that come up. And the difficulties are typically linked with our habits of mind, you know, our, our, our regular habits of life. You know, if you have a habit of 
worrying a lot about the future and you know what's going on in the world or worrying about your family members um it will not be in the least surprising that when you sit down and meditate to meditate that worry may come up it doesn't always but you know it may a different things can come up but but it, it's not surprising when it does because that's a habit of mind that we've created through repetition over time and if that's something that's you know a part of our life then we kind of tend to get drawn in that direction in meditation um similarly if you know if we're if we tend to judge ourselves or be harsh on our you know towards ourselves you know and, oh i'm i'm never able to do things or i'm useless at this or you know this harsh judgments the inner critic is sometimes called then um you know then it's quite likely that these these habits of mind will arise when we meditate so meditation is not a kind of a time where we escape from i mean maybe some people might want to use it in that way but it's not really an escape from our lives because our lives will show up you know not always you know in the ways we might expect but our lives will show up in our practice so what that means is it's both challenging but it's also very promising because it means we can <clears throat> we have the opportunity and the space to be able if we choose to to really pay attention to what you know how the mind is working maybe in our daily lives typically in our daily lives we don't necessarily have you know, oh my i'm in this i'm caught up with that notice the way our mind is working but in our meditation practice you know we have that that's really a gift of the practice that we can say okay i'm noticing this is where my mind is going um and that we can say okay how can i work with this and so i'm going to talk today about these five classical hindrances um i'll i'll, I'll name them and just say a little bit about them the five hindrances are first one is sense desire or the wanting mind this is kind of the energy of the mind moving towards something we want or oh, i I'm, i so much want some ice cream right now you know or i so much want you know a pleasant feeling of of um of um you know having um you know just having a pleasant experience you know just like oh i, I wish i was uh, you know i wish i was on the beach and just lying there and not having to worry about anything you know wish i you know so the mind going you know could be pleasant tastes experiences anything that comes through the senses you know through the taste touch smell feel um sounds you know anything oh i'd love to i'd love to hear that song again and we get pulled back you know and um you know so whatever it is it's getting you know the mind getting pulled in the direction um of something we're wanting what i should say about all of these these hindrances is they all have an afflictive quality they all have a difficult quality or painful quality so i'm not just talking about oh wouldn't it be nice to have a nice meal you know or you know when the meditation's over it would be nice to have a lunch you know a, a nourishing lunch or something nothing wrong at all with that the problem with the hindrances is when we get hooked on them they have a hook to them and so sense desire the wanting mind is where we get hooked on the wanting similarly with the second of the hindrances we get hooked on aversion disliking wanting to get rid of i don't like this i don't like this uncomfortable feeling i don't like that it's too cold or too hot or i don't like the sounds that are going on outside my window they're bothering me you know i want those to be different you know so we know this in our lives because you know we know we're all familiar with like not liking things aversion wanting to push things away this is the second energy 
And again, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be comfortable, wanting to be warm, all of those things. It's when the mind, again, gets hooked, gets fixated. Um, the third of these energies is known as sloth and torpor, sloth and torpor. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, um, a, a, both a body and mind collapsing, really. It's tiredness, it's lethargy, dullness, lack of vitality, lack of energy. And, and it's not just tiredness, because tiredness is tiredness, you know, something can be tired. But when it has a kind of problematical quality, you know, I don't want to be feeling this right now. We're wanting something different. And that's the, it's the kind of the wanting something to be different than it is. Um, that's, the, that's the problem. And this is this, the third one, when, when the energy, it's kind of a collapsing energy, and we kind of like don't have the energy to be able to be present. And the fourth of these is the opposite of that, really. That's when we, the, there's too much energy and it's, not, and it's not really balanced. And this is the, the, the hindrance of restlessness and worry. You know, this is kind of a compound like sloth and torpor. It's both kind of body and mind. Restlessness is the kind of the bodily agitation of like, oh, I'm not feeling comfortable. I, I'm not feeling settled. I want to find something that's comfortable. We kind of go on and we're, we're moving away from our experience towards what we think will make us happy. So that sense of restlessness and worry is more the mind. Like, oh, what might happen and this and the future and all of that. Anxiety, fear for the future, what might happen. This is the fourth quality of restlessness and worry. And the fifth one is doubt. This is when there's wavering, there's indecision. We can't move forward because, you know, we're, we're, it's a kind of stuck energy. It's an energy of... of um, it's not just not knowing, because there can be a helpful and a wholesome not knowing. You know, in Zen, they talk about you know, mind, keeping the mind open. So I'm not talking about that. It's when, when the doubt becomes really a kind of a debilitating doubt, where, where for example, you know, I, I say, oh, I can't do this. Oh, I'm no good. You know, other people can do this, but I, I just don't have the you know, the attention span to be able to meditate, or, you know, that kind of doubt, or doubt, oh, the teachings, well, no, I, I, these don't have, you know, they don't really work for the age we're living in now. They may have been helpful, you know, 2,500 years ago, but no, I don't think these are, these are any, any use at all. That kind of doubt um, is, is what prevents us being present and takes us away, takes us away from our direct experience and doesn't allow us to be really present. So these are the five, just to name these hindrances and the kind of the energies that, that, are un, that underlie them. Um, and they're called hindrances because they're obstacles to practice, they're obstacles to seeing things clearly. And ultimately, there are obstacles to being free. So as long as we're caught up in these hindrances or any of these hindrances, we can't really be fully present and we can't really be free because we're, 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 we're caught up in them. We're, in a sense, imprisoned by, as long as we're caught up in a hindrance, we're imprisoned by it. And until we find the way out, that's you know we're gonna we're not gonna be we're not gonna be able to be genuinely happy, at ease, or free. You know, so it's really important. You know, the Buddha taught it's really important to pay attention to these, these, uh, these energies, these, um, these difficult energies, of the hindrances. Um, they they play a really important role in the teachings, as I mentioned there, um, in the Buddha's teachings of the four foundations of mindfulness, the Sati Patana Sutta, the foundations of mindfulness. The fourth of the foundations, which I think of as mindfulness of our experience through the lens of 
key Buddhist teachings. And the first of the key Buddhist teachings that, that, um, that the Buddha lays out are the hindrances. You know, others include the five aggregates, uh, others in, uh, include the, the senses, the, the six senses, including the mind, and also the awakening factors and the Four Noble Truths. It was using these teachings as a way of being able to suffering. The, the first, I'm not get, obviously not getting into the, all of those right now, but the, the hindrances are, are the first of these um, of these teachings that the Buddha lays out that are really important to look at. Joseph Goldstein, who's written uh, many books, but one wonderful one on on that sutta, on the Satipatthana Sutta. This is called Mindfulness, a Practical Guide to Awakening. Mindfulness, a Practical Guide to Awakening. He says, why does the Buddha begin here with the hindrances, you know, begin these this collection of teachings? He says, when we're not mindful of them, the hindrances envelop the mind and obstruct it from developing wise discernment regarding skillful and unskillful actions. So we're not really able to say this leads to happiness, this leads to suffering, because we're caught up. Our mind is really clouded by the hindrances or by a hindrance. They hinder the mind's developing concentration and other awakening factors, other skillful factors to help us wake up. And they prevent the realization of the Four Noble Truths. They prevent us from being able to see where we're really suffering and to let go of suffering. In order to proceed on the path, he says, we first need to know how to work skillfully with what impedes us what impedes our journey. So we can't go forward on the path as until we've worked with what gets in the way, you know, what's blocking the road. You know, there's a big roadblock there. And until we've kind of untangled that, of kind of unpicked it and found our way through, found a path through, we're not going to be able to move forward into the kind of mind states that, um, that lead, to, um, lead to true happiness. So, so he says we really need to deal with these, um, these, these hindrances. The Buddha spoke of these hindrances. He, he called them the five, five obstructions, hindrances, encirclers of the mind, encirclers of the mind, weakeners of wisdom. He also said these are makers of blindness, causing lack of vision, causing lack of knowledge, detrimental to wisdom, tending to vexation or annoyance, leading away from Nibbana, leading away from freedom. So all of this is to say they prevent us from seeing things clearly and they lead us away from freedom. So it's easy to think of them as solid. You know, this is a problem. I'm, you know, I'm caught up in anger. You know, and to see the anger as solid and, and a problem, I've got to somehow get rid of the anger. But in fact, all of these, all of these energies are impermanent. They come and they go. And the problem really lies in when we get identified with the energies. It's not the problem that they're there, because if they're there and we can just see them come and go, then they don't they don't they aren't problematical they're just okay anger comes up you know i think the dalai lama's often asked about you are angry you know he says yeah but, but you know through my practice and I'm paraphrasing he says i'm able to just see the anger fairly quickly and let it come and go so the anger doesn't lead to festering it doesn't lead to hatred it doesn't lead to conflict and violence because okay it's just an energy it's a message from the universe something is telling me that this i need to do something here i need to take care of this situation i need to address this i need to protect myself if it's a case of if i'm threatened you know i'm angry because somebody's attacking me you know that anger comes up but 
is how we deal with that. You know, in certain situations, if a dog is running towards us and it's kind of going for us, then obviously we want to react with all of the appropriate emotions, and we typically we will. But that's very different from you know, sitting in meditation and thinking about, you know, a politician, <laughs> you know, what they did and didn't do, and then, you know, spinning that out and getting angry and like, oh, God, you know, oh, what will I do, you know, and all of that, um, it, it doesn't serve, and it only keeps us more and more hooked in suffering. So the key, really, to all of these hindrances is to is to see their emptiness, ultimately, to see, to be able to open to the energy, the energy of aversion or the energy of wanting without getting hooked on the object that the mind may be putting up there. Okay, you know, the energy of wanting, okay, a feeling that I'm wanting and it typically constellates around something I'm wanting. You know, I'm wanting this. You know, maybe later it's I'm wanting that. But then, you know, and, and we get hooked. You know, we think of it, see, see it in, in addiction. You know, we get hooked, whether it's a drink or a drug or it's sex or it's shopping or whatever it might be. The mind gets fixated. I've got to have this. To be happy, I've got to have this. I need this right now. My body needs it. My heart needs it. My mind needs it. I've got to have it. But we recognize that that the thing itself won't provide the happiness that we're looking for. And so what we, what we come back to with practice and with wisdom is, is, can I stay with the energies without, you know, acting it out, without fixating on the thing that I want? And when we, can, when we do this through the practice of mindfulness, you know, and compassionate awareness, then all of these energies can come and go without being a problem and we can um, that we can find we can experience freedom we can live freely so they're natural en energies they're impersonal they're not a problem they're only a problem when the mind that's really the key to um, to work with these, um, with these energies that if we can work with what the energy underneath the thing that we want or the, you know, the thing we're worried about, you know, we're fixated on like, oh, things might, oh, this is going to happen and that bad thing's going to happen. Rather than getting caught up in that, we can just... Feel that is good. Pardon? The Buddha has five similes for these hindrances. I, I, I think they're quite helpful. You see if you find them helpful. He says, imagine a pool, a clear pool of water, a pool filled with clear water that we can see to the bottom of and we could, you know, we could look in it and we could see our image in it. We could think of our mind in this way and we can think of each of these five hindrances as obstructions that that you know make it difficult to see things clearly see the water clearly so using this image of the of of the bowl or pool of clear water sense desire he says is like having colored dye put into the into the water you know so the water becomes colored by let's say the red dye or the purple dye or whatever that the, the, we can't see through the water we can't see the clarity of the water because it's colored by this dye that's been put in so you can think of in the same way the wanting mind being like the mind colored by that quality of that wanting the mind isn't clear because it's it's affected it's colored by the um, by the, the, the wanting, the desire, and being hooked on the thing. He says aversion is like water being brought to, the boil, to a boil. 
so it's the water is no longer calm and clear now it's it's bubbling and all of the energy and the molecules are you know and that's kind of the energy of aversion we're kind of the energy would you know fight or flight kind of energy so again the mind isn't clear if we look at anything through the lens of aversion we're not going to see it clearly we're going to see through through a glass darkly as they say you know through we're going to see what we see will be colored or affected by the energy by that energy by the anger or by the wanting so we couldn't you know if we're wanting something we can't look at that thing objectively without the wanting coloring the you know the thing the, the experience itself the third of the of these energies sloth and torpor he says it's like a bowl the bowl of water the water overgrown with algae overgrown with algae you know kind of green algae all around it so again you don't see the water clearly so the mind in that sense is kind of overgrown i think it's a good image for for that kind of collapsing energy of sloth and torpor um, the fourth is restlessness and worry and this is he says is water swept by the wind you know tossed you know by the by the wind blowing this way and that way and again, you can see the mind, when, when the mind is, is kind of tossed this way and that way, we're not able to see clearly. We're not able to go in the directions we need to go in. Um, and the fifth is doubt. And this is the image is of um, um, the water filled with mud, you know, mud put in the water. So the mud prevents us the water seeing the water clearly the water being clear similarly our mind is muddied by by doubt you know we can't see things clearly because you know under undermining it is is the doubt you know preventing us from um from seeing clearly so think about these these images um and and if it's helpful and you know some may be more helpful than than others but these these images these similes for for how the mind is affected and and one thing that i think hopefully comes across clearly is that we can't the mind can't see clearly when it's afflicted by when it's caught up in any of these hindrances so i'm going to there's a lot more to say about the hindrances but what i'm going to i'm going to limit it today to um to just the um the buddha's instructions for working with the hindrances and then um, in coming weeks we'll kind of be able to get more into the content of the hindrances but the buddha gives five instructions for working with the hindrances you know he says first ask is the hindrance present is sense desire wanting mind present and to know what this feels like, to know if it's present, to know if it's absent, you know, to know, OK, how does it feel when this isn't present? So know if it's present, know if it's absent and how that feels. Know the conditions that give rise to, let's say, the wanting mind or give rise to aversion, you know, aversion that it doesn't just doesn't tend to just pop out of nowhere it tends to come out of what we've been paying attention to or haven't been paying attention to so for example um you know if you find you you're getting angry about the political situation you know or yes let, let's take that as an example um you know if you if you're someone who watches you know very adversarial conflictual kind of tv you know typically cable tv that has a point of view that you know we're right they're wrong yet we're good they're bad then that's very likely to engender you know that kind of us and them conflictual kind of way of looking at things so it won't be surprising that anger and judgment come up so knowing the conditions that give rise to the hindrance is really is really important really clear really necessary to be able to work with it knowing how that that's the third the fourth is knowing how a 
a hindrance that has arisen, how it can be abandoned. So if we're actually feeling the wanting mind, you know, or aversion, how do I work with it? And typically the way we work with it is the way we, you know, we invite ourselves to do in, in meditation is just to be present with compassion and acceptance to what's here, letting everything come and go, not getting into a struggle with it, not holding on, not pushing away, just, you know, welcoming the guests, saying yes to what is, deep acceptance of, of what's here. And the, the, so that's the fourth. And then knowing how to prevent the arising of this hindrance in the future. What can we do to prevent it arising? So what's, what's I think, really helpful about the Buddha's teachings is it's not just about what's here right now, but it's also about how that came in, how, how the mind state came into existence, how we might work with it and how we might prevent it from arising in the future. So it's a very kind of sequential, very, uh, very much concerned with con causes and conditions, what helps something arise, what prevents something from arising. Um, and so, so being able to, um, to work with, um, work skillfully with the hindrances when they arise. I um you know I was thinking of some examples and and you know as an example of the wanting mind I remember a, a situation which was a real teaching to me in my own experience I remember I I was kind of for a while back um in the in the mid 90s I was kind of teaching, university college teaching, and that kind of thought maybe I would get into that, you know, you know, try and get a regular position. And I, something came up and it was a job teaching um, in, in Western Ireland. And, and I, you know, as many of you know, I love Ireland and my, my parents are both from there and my ancestors from there. And I thought, oh, this would be great. And the job seemed like a really good, you know, is in political science and, uh, you know, something that I, I might really enjoy. And um, I remember, um, you know, applying for the job and getting, you know, getting an interview and they flew me over for the interview. And all of it was, was you know, I felt, a, 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 you know, a fairly appropriate kind of, you know, oh, wouldn't I, I'd like to get this job, you know, like quite appropriate for any of us to feel, you know, I'd like a job, you know, that would allow me, you know, things would, a job that I'd like to do, you know, that gave me autonomy and creativity and vacation or whatever it is, you know. And so, and there's nothing wrong with that. But something happened, I think, after the interview, and I thought I thought I'd done well enough, and I thought, oh, I couldn't get it. Something changed, and my mind got hooked around it, you know. And I think of it, something, there was a kind of shift, and it went from just a an everyday skillful wanting into, you know, what I think of as Gollum with the ring, you know, in The Lord of the Rings, you know, my precious, you know, I've got the ring, I've got it. And, and it's that, this is what the hindrances are really concerned with. It's kind of when we get hooked on them in this way with the wanting. And this is what happened to me. And I thought, oh, I've got it. I think I've got it, you know. And I kind of started building futures around it. Oh, yeah, if I get a house, da, 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 you know, all of this. And of course, I didn't get the job. <laughs> Somebody else got the job, and I'm sure they were highly qualified to get it. Um, and I felt a real sense of disappointment. I almost felt a kind of sense of shame that I'd that I'd got so caught up in it as well, you know, because I, at least at that stage, I think I'd begun my practice and kind of felt felt bad about it. So a whole mixture of things. And so I just use that as an illustration of how these hindrances can really, we can get hooked on them and how important it is to unhook ourselves. And, to, and, and essentially we begin really by just opening to, okay, can I be with what's here? If it is a feeling of wanting 
also involves kind of being able to shift the mind to more wholesome states, you know, out of, let's say, out of the version or judgment to loving kindness. So there are various different ways of working with the hindrances that I'll talk about. Um, but I'll leave it there for now, just kind of giving that overview of the hindrances, how they hinder, how they get in the way, how we can work with them, some images for, you know, how we can see them and how really they're not in themselves a problem. but only become a problem when we get really hooked on them, identified with them. So it's really essential for us to learn the skills and deepen the skills to be able to see them, see their emptiness and, and let them go. Because it's an essential step or steps, probably many steps, in the, in the movement along the path. So I hope that's helpful as a little bit of an overview. And um, I know you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, about this, but maybe pause here um, and I'll, when we come back, um, I'll invite some reflection on, you know, how these arise for you in your own practice and in your own life. But now we'll move, hand it over to Emily for some, uh, for some movement. Thank you all. Thank you for your kindness and attention thanks Emily. thank you thank you very much Hugh and let's let me invite you to stand up and just expand your arms up overhead reaching up exhale soften your shoulders lowering them down bring them down to shoulder height and just sway from side to side opening up into the space around you. You could lift one heel as you turn in the opposite direction, swaying, energizing your body. Now open up wide. And I'm trying to back up. Just tap on the top of your head just for a moment. Moving around the top of your head, come down the sides of your face, your temples lightly, your jaw. Moving on down, come to your chest. Just giving yourself some real packs on the chest or even pounding. That's good. And then open up wide, reach up, we'll stretch, grasping your left wrist in your right hand, extend out to the right and tilt. Reaching, breathing in to lift a little and then exhale, softening down, lowering your shoulders down. Good. Inhale up, switch wrists. Extending out to the left, exhale, over. Another inhale, lifting slightly. Exhale, soften into it, just dropping down. Less effort, creating more stretch. Inhale, up. Float your arms down, roll your shoulders. Just enjoy that mobility. And roll them the other way. Now bring your hands up into cactus arms, bent at the elbows, and then allow your hands to fall, keeping the elbows up. Lift up, exhale down. Lifting up, exhale down. Lift up, extend your arms out. Take a look over your left hands, your left palms up. And on the inhale, switch to the right and the left and the right and the left and the right. And then drop your arms, move your shoulders independently. Some good rotation moves here. Excellent and roll them the other way. 
and then come to center. Place your hands above your knees and extend into a flat back, seeing how you could draw your torso away from your pelvis, feeling solid with your legs, your lifting up, pressing on your feet, and then drop down with just your head, your arms, shoulders, dropping down, but pressing on your feet to keep, to keep the movement in how you fold at the hip crease. Breathing in, exhaling, only going as low as you want to be. You are your own teacher here. Place your hands above your knees, soften your knees, draw up, stacking your vertebrae, bring your shoulders up around your ears, dropping them down, and then take a moment to just do your own dance. However you might wish to move. And then come to center again. Turning your palms out, bring your hands above your head, palms together, bringing them down to your heart, out to the group, down to the earth. And with an exhale, whoosh, draw them up, centering down to your heart. And take a bow, everyone. So grateful to be with you. Thank you, Emily. Grateful to you. Thank you for lovely, lovely practice. <laughs> yeah, it's some good sharing. Thank you, Chala, for uh, for your your detailed shares there and. Um, Cassie says academia is very good at invoking the hindrances. <laughs> uh huh. Rachel, at least four of these are involved in my current creative pursuit. Thank you. Uh, an appreciated image of getting reeled in on a spinning axle. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, let's see. How are we doing? I think um, time-wise today we um, uh, would be good to stay in the full group, and so we'll do that. And next time we'll do a, we'll do some small groups, and so um, maybe invite uh, invite any sharing uh, or any questions people might might have around anything today, around the talk, around the meditation, around anything that uh, that's come up for you and we can uh, you can do that both in the um, in the uh, chat or if you'd like to you can uh, raise your hand and uh, we can uh, hear from you let's see um, I've got I don't know who this is, but it's Pal Tech US. Oh, that's, that, I'm sorry that I will I apologize. This is this no is by mistake. Uh, Hugh, um, I, I looked through an, uh, my corporate uh, uh, Zoom. Okay, sure, no my, problem. Who is this? My name is Hisham Javi. Hisham, how are you? Fine. I just wanted to ask. Uh, this is fascinating. Why we why do we forget the five? hindrances on day to day i mean how, how to have like a mechanism to keep reminding us um you know that's a great question um how we forget or why we forget um i would say we forget because we um we cultivate habits of mind and habits of life that um, take us away from that kind of awareness. I believe if we're going to be aware of 
the hindrances and the price we pay for the hindrances that um, we have to almost everyone i don't say everyone but almost everyone will need a practice of awareness will need a training in awareness because i think there are so you know putting aside maybe a one in a thousand or one in a million people who may be just naturally so present so kind so un affected by what's going on in the world that they can just kind of you know live in 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 a kind of a, 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 an experience of peace and well-being and freedom the vast majority of us though are affected very much by you know the conditions of our life our families our communities our societies our world and um we we have our we all have our mechanisms for getting what we need and um you know thriving surviving you know protecting ourselves etc and what we tend to do i believe is we tend to get hooked into ways of finding happiness and well-being that actually don't lead us to happiness and well-being you know that we think if we get more goods or more possessions you know we think you know we we labor under illusions and until we until we have a way of shining a light on ourselves on our experience on our lives on this human life and really examining it in the way that we do in these teachings and these practices and and in other wisdom traditions as well <clears throat> we will tend to stay hooked in these ways of living and behaviors that actually take us in a direction opposite from where we we really want to want to go you know the dalai lama often says we all want to be happy and yet at the same time we tend to have ways of going about being happy that actually don't lead us to happiness you know how many people in our world are living in ways where they, you know we all want to be happy but they that that they're doing things and probably fairer to say we are doing things get the pronoun right um that that actually lead us in a different direction so i believe we need a path of awareness a path of practice to be able to see clearly because otherwise we will tend to be swept along by our habitual responses by the messages of our culture you know if everybody around us is saying you know compete with the joneses keep up with the joneses get more things you'll be happy if you have this you know and that those are the messages we're hearing from the media from you know the people around us then it will be very hard for us to kind of go in a different direction and these teachings and these practices are really going against the grain they're going in a different direction they're swimming if you like against the stream um but they're essential if we're going to wake up because i think we know deep down that that the things that the culture tells us is going to be make us happy actually won't make us happy you know the buddha said what the world calls happiness i call suffering what the world calls suffering i call happiness you know that 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 what's put out there as happiness isn't in fact happiness and what you know the the things like letting go that are cultivated within these teachings and practices most people say oh i don't want to let go why should i let go you know i'll be taken advantage of or i won't get what i want or i won't get what i need you know but there's a, as we know a deep wisdom and a deep freedom in letting go in letting go of the kind of clinging that i've been we've been talking about today so it's kind of a longish answer but but those are some of the things i think think keep us you know hooked in these you know looking for love in all the wrong places i call that i use that phrase another time i think
Um, Gabriella, would uh, please, I hope that's useful. Uh, Hisham, thank you. Very much so, thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> This this whole the whole hindrances I was thinking of um, how how it's affected me in in regular life and they seem to be the what was coming up for me is the uh, is the experience of addiction and how pervasive those hindrances can go with addiction because it's it's not just the seeking sensory pleasure, but it's seeking relief from whatever it is that I have aversion to. So whatever it is, the thoughts, right? The self-judgment or somebody's unhappy or it's not good at my job or I don't feel comfortable in my own skin. There's anxiety. There's a, there's a sensation I, I, I can't sit with and I need relief from, and therefore I end up going to whatever substance. It used to be alcohol, then it was food, and then it was, um, I had various eating disorders and over-exercising, and with the idea that if, if I can do this, then I'll be okay. Yeah. Um, and it's so, it's so, because these, these, all of these hindrances, right, then there's the the sloth and the torpor about doing the things that I need to do in order to get to sit through the discomfort and not go to whatever substance it is that ends up being self-harming, right? Um, or continuing like in the 12-step program to, to do all the things that they want you to do. Um, and then the self-doubt that comes with that or the or the or all of the arrows, right? The self-judgment, all of that. So it just was very, very, um, hits me very profoundly about all of this because of my experience with addiction in, in various forms. Um, and also somebody brought up aging as a woman in this, in this particular, um, society. And that, that is a whole nother avalanche of stuff. Um, so thank you for that, Hugh. And if you have any, any feedback, I would always love to hear it. Thank you. And thank you, Gabrielle. And, and I mean, I think you've just said it so very clearly. I mean, we are, we are, whether we're talking about it in, in the addiction in a kind of DSM-5 kind of way, you know, the kind of, you know, how, how things are, um, you know, clinically defined, etc. But from a Dharma standpoint, I mean, it, you know, we would include things that are beyond, you know, beyond the, the you know, typical food, alcohol, et cetera, you know, um, drugs, et cetera. Um, but it is that, it's that really, it's that energy. And the energy is the same energy that underlies, um, you know, classical addictions and the everyday kind of things of, um, you know, everyday habits that we get into that actually prevent us from, from, from being present, take us away, and ultimately, as hindrances, as you said, you know, hinder, hinder our ability to be able to do what we need to do, you know, to take the steps we need to do to, to let go of, of, of unhelpful patterns and cultivate skillful ones. Um, we, um, it, it very much is that, you know, that being hooked you know, and again, it includes both the classical addictions, but also the other kind of ways that we get that we get hooked, where we're no longer really in the driver's seat. You know, what is in the driver's seat is the thing that we're caught up in. You know, the um, the thing that we want, or the person that we dislike, or that we hate. Um, that sense of separation. Um, that comes up is what needs to be addressed. And the practices of compassionate awareness of our own experience and all of the other Dharma skills, you know, there's not just one practice. At the core, very much is the practice of can I be with this? Can I open to this? Rather than going off to, you know, the thing I'm wanting, for example but also being able to skillfully shift to another, you know, another 
reflection, for example, wise reflection, something that will take me away from the obsession with the thing I'm focused on. And, you know, that's why I love, I mean, I love gratitude as a practice of just being able to come back. It, it kind of pulls us out of, uh, you know, the ways that we're, we're, you know, we're hooked on the things we're in. So thank you for, thank you so much for sharing that. I think you just said it really, really um, expressed it really clearly. Thank you, Gabriella. Um, Achala, Achala part. Um, yes, please. We'll take this Hi. and we'll have finished with a, a short meditation. Thank you. Okay. Um, interesting because I also look at this through the lens of mindfulness and, but also, um, it's these exact things, these exact, um, craving and aversion have actually been, I'm doing a workshop in it for a process. Uh, disorder or process addiction and craving and aversion um, as a setup to indulging that obsession and that um, addiction have come up over and over. Um, but it's also it's also classic. Um, I do an inventory whenever I'm feeling disturbed or agitated and not and and not present or not able to function and. Um, Craving and aversion are kind of um, self-centered fear or selfishness. I want, I don't want. And they're about not being, and gratitude is being present to the, the, the end of the inventory is always, there's always some good thing that we did or that is. And that's what I always come to at the end of it. Um, what I was going to say, though, was... Um, I'm I'm very I'm very aware of these things all the time. Um and I've I've been meditating in bed before my feet hit the floor because that seems to be the only way out of um getting into like the monkey mind and the, getting into the the material orders of the day and all the obsessions and all the distractions. But it feels like cheating in a way. And I'm also very aware of the sloth and torpor, and it feels like a distraction, like my disease or the thing other than my divine, like the shadow self, or just, it just seems like a distraction, like, oh, I'm too tired, or falling into victimhood, or I'm too old. And I've been doing yoga every morning as well. So, um, but, so yeah, I, I don't know if these are good things that I'm doing. And in a sense, I don't want to push, in a sense, being present to these cravings, aversions, and feelings of sleepiness are part of some forms of practice, <laughs> just noting that I'm feeling tired. Um, yet I'm finding that the focus of a practice starting early in the day or framing out my day, anchoring my day. But I do somewhat feel like I'm cheating um, by doing my practice in bed. I, I don't know if I'm making any sense. I hope I am. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's, uh, no, I think it's really helpful. Um, you know, with, with any, in, in, any practice, it's possible to 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 kind of use the practice in a way that that isn't skillful you know that that's kind of a um in a way it's part of the still being hooked but we're but we're like you using it to um I, I'm, I'm not sure if i have the right simple way of explaining it but but it's all what I think what I want to say is it's always helpful to look at is there a kind of a shadow in how I'm working with this where where I'm actually have an agenda that is not just of being present and being free, but of somehow getting the thing I want, you know, I mean, I just use an example for uh, of, um, you know, if we were working with some discomfort or pain. And 
we were to you know say okay i'm i'm going to i'm going to really be present i'm going to practice acceptance i'm going to practice you know accepting 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 and then you know we say okay i'm going to accept this for for 5 minutes and but it needs to be gone in 5 minutes you know that then then the acceptance gets colored by the agenda i've got to get to the place where the pain is gone so rather than actually accepting i'm actually caught still caught up in the agenda of I've, I've got to get to you know the thing that the thing that i want and so it's not a problem when that happens but it's just something to be seen it's something to be noticed when the mind goes off and so it, it it's really just the practice of wise attention to move into you know when we talk about certain practices we use the term near enemies you know we talk about the brahma viharas each having near enemies where compassion might turn into pity you know they just take a different coloring on there which has clinging attached to it you know so it's not the genuine it's not genuine com- fully genuine compassion it's compassion but then it's been turned into i'm here and you're there i'm up and you're down that kind of thing so just to it, it just really being being aware and and seeing okay i maybe i need to shift more into that openness i've told the story of giving away a chocolate ginger bar on a retreat and how you know i didn't i wasn't aware of it at the time but i had an agenda you know i wanted i wanted people to be happy and enjoy it and somebody i probably just picked it up and took it and but that was an you know sh- showed me that my my generosity wasn't you know pure generosity it had an agenda to it you know so just to be aware of that when when anything um you know when we're in, in any of these practices but but essentially the practice of of the willingness to be with and on your question of of whether it's it's good you know to practice in bed whether it's helpful that's just something to look at for yourself you know it can be i mean it can be just look at what's going on in the mind if if it's coming from a place of oh yeah just you know kind of self indulgence perhaps then okay then that's something to look at say okay can i just bring some energy in to to get up and you know start doing things versus if it was something of um you know just feeling that being still and quiet in bed allowed the space to be able to really reflect on things i do that quite a lot you know if i wake up maybe at 6 or 6:30 but i don't really want to get up till 7:30 or 8 i'll often you know just rest there in that state and sometimes it can be a really beautiful state we call it the bardo you know like the tibetan bardo you know that in between space it's kind of a space here in between sleep and waking and it can i find it can be a really beautiful space space for reflection so nothing nothing wrong with that and nothing wrong with napping napping is a very healthy thing too <laughs> anyway so but thank you thank you acha i, I what was something that i said that led you to believe that i i, I wasn't i don't think i was saying that um yeah oh, it's okay no no um, sorry if i misunderstood I, your question way, my, yeah no i think my practices have all about being really willing to be very present to yeah. everything happening including letting go um i think some of the practices i was doing um were got guided but they led to being willing to let go um breathe in new things and let go and being aware of actual pain in my body that was very unpleasant that i did not want to be aware of and i do anything that gets my attention and doesn't allow allows me to be present and focused and with Lovely. outside and inside so okay. i don't know if it sounded if i was misrepresenting in some way No no I'm saying that I'm doing it first thing before other things start to get my attention because I get very obsessive um with I got to do this I got to do that and doing it first is about this is a priority while 
Well, I, again, what you were saying about being in the barter, like literally going from yoga nidra state to going right into uh, doing a meditation. But, yeah. All right. I'm sorry. Thank you. I don't need to defend. It's no, thank, you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And if I answered a different question, that's, you know, that's fine. And, and uh, no, you, you've, you you very clearly said what you just said. So thank you. Thank you, Chala. And, and thank you, everyone. Let's just take a minute to to finish up and then we'll we'll have a few announcements. Maybe just take a minute to check in with yourself and notice what's present. Just a kind attention to what's here. Breathing in breathing out, just feeling the presence of all of us here together, appreciating everyone, everyone's practice, the support of each other, wishing everyone well. Maybe send a wish of loving kindness to everyone and out into the world, out into the world, into the suffering world. Wishing everyone well, without exception. May all beings be happy, be free, free of suffering. <laughs>